Yes, so uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, usually I teach that in a two semester course. So today I have 45 minutes, so I will speak a little faster. Um, so what we're all concerned with is essentially always the same equation. It's the many body Schrodinger equation. In the static case, that's the equation. And I have an order. This circle is the sum of the kinetic energies of the power equation. It's not the potential <coughs> of the and the Coulomb equation. So it's simple enough, one can write down this Hamiltonian in two lines, that's the problem. Why don't we just solve the equation? Why don't we do that? Well, well, let's imagine we had a super hypercomputer by which we could actually solve this equation. Let's say for a moderately small system, let's say Oxygen. And so we imagine we have the body function. And uh, let's suppose we want to store it on some electronic medium. So how do we do that? Well, we, one way, it's not the only way, one way is to discretize space. Right? So uh, imagine this vectors here. Percent degree. So, so for hydrogen, right, uh, that would, that this would be very easy. Right, so, there the wave function only depends on one coordinate vector. So, that is xyz. As we say, we have 10 points in x direction, 10 points in y direction, 10 points in z direction. So, we store the value of the wave function at 10 times 10 times 10 for each direction uh, grid points. So here we need 1,000 grid points. And let's say we do this for the helium atom. So there we have three electrons. So that's six coordinates, x1, y1, z1, and x2, y2, z2. So then clearly we have 10 times 10 times 10, and then same story again. Right? So we have 10 to the 6 grid points on which we have to store the value of the wave. Then let's go to oxygen. And so there we have eight electrons. Each coordinate vector has x, y, z. So we have three times eight is ten to the twenty-four grid points on which we want to store the value of the wave. So let's be honest, let's store the, the value of the wave function just with one byte, let's say. Value of wave function at each grid point. 
uh, one byte. So we need to store ten to the twenty-four bytes. So think of a hard disk uh, that we use at home. Typically, it has a terabyte. So that's ten to the twelve bytes. So to store the wave function of the oxygen atom, we need uh, ten to the twelve disks. Right. And we got one disk has about uh, 200 grams of weight. So we need 2 times 10 to the 14 grams of hard disks, which is 2 times 10 to the 8 tons of hard disks. So oh, that's a finite number. But it's a lot. Is this the four right between in the zip file? So second, what was the question? Is this the four right between in the zip file? Yes, so that, it, it's a reasonable question. We can, of course, save a lot of space by all kinds of tricks, zipping it, or doing it in a more clever way, rather than representing the wave function on grid points, we can expand in a basis and only store the coefficients. It doesn't matter which way you do it. Um, what this shows is the well-known fact that the, uh, that the configuration space on which the wave function lives grows exponentially with a number of boxes. This is a fact of life, whichever way you do it. That's a fact of life. You can't get around it. So what can one do? Well, there's one possibility. Uh, that's the first strategy, one could say, to calculate, uh, to try to calculate the wave function anyway. <laughs> basic strategies. Strategies. First, try to calculate the wave function anyways. It's so called Wave function theories, and that comes in different flavors, for example, configuration interaction, so there you write the wave function as sum over determinants. Right. Uh, a very interesting uh, uh, method of uh, uh, that has recently made a lot of progress is so-called stochastic CI. where you have uh, uh, very smart tricks, stochastic tricks, to select the important determinants. And uh, you can by now have a summation over something, not a million, but uh, a billion or so uh, determinants. And you get closer and closer to the wave function of, of real systems. But remember, the exponential increase. So you don't really get really to, to very large systems. Think of a polymer right, or a, a protein, right? something really complicated. It's easy to see that the weight of the disks exceeds the weight of the universe. So we have a problem here. Right? <laughs> so this, this exponential increase is, is a difficulty. Now, uh, other methods are coupled cluster 
or quantum Monte Carlo. And these, these methods have certain scalings, not necessarily exponential. Right? That's important to realize. But it also tells you that if it's not exponential, you, you throw away an exponentially increasing amount of information. This sounds terrible, but uh, it may not be so serious. Because usually you want to calculate only a few relevant numbers, like the lowest 20 total energies or so, and maybe for those it doesn't really matter to throw away a lot of information. So if one does that clever, then it gets really close to the right numbers. So that, that is one strategy. And the other basic strategy is, one could call it functional theories. There, the idea is to write total energy as functional of a simpler quantity. Simpler means simpler than the wave function. And then minimize or optimize this quantity uh, by variationally minimizing the energy. And then So density functional theory is one such example. In that case, the density is the simpler quantity, and we write the total energy as a functional of the density, and minimize, and then get Kuhn-Sham equations. But uh, density functional theory is not the only possibility that we have. There's other possibilities. And uh, most of my lecture is basically one big table that compares three such functional theories. And I will uh, use these three boards for the three uh, for the three simpler quantities. So this board This part will be the many body part where you write everything in terms of the one body green function. So this part. will be reserved for the one body density matrix. Here, I 
write various things like with this line, what the quantity actually is. That will be the first line. So let's start here. What is the quantity density? And the bar is n times integral d r2 n psi r r2 n squared. So you can integrate over r2 to rn. So that's the variable on which the density depends. On the density matrix, gamma r prime similar. Integrate over R2 to Rn of psi star R prime R2 to Rn psi R R2 to Rn and the one by green function is the following object and again involves the ground state wave function. So you I didn't emphasize that. I was look here at the ground state wave function the following here as well, the same ground state wave function. And it's the expectation value of the following. T is a so-called time ordering operator. And here we have the uh, um, annihilation operator and second quantization of the electron R at time T. It's in the Heisenberg picture. That's what pH means. And then psi dagger of R prime T prime in the Heisenberg picture. And this is sandwiched in the same ground state of my function that we have everywhere here. So what's the, the, the physical meaning of what is written here? It means we have the ground state wave function here. In the ground state wave function, or on top of the ground, uh, ground state wave function, we create an additional particle at point r prime, at time t prime. Then we annihilate the particle at a different time t and at a different location, r. That's the meaning of this. Then we project on the same ground state where we started. So it's kind of the probability of after creating and annihilating the particle coming back uh, to the same. So that's the physical meaning. And from the way I've said it, it's immediately clear that if this wave function, like the ground state wave function, does not change in time, that this object should depend only on the time difference. Right? If I have the ground state wave function here, and at some point t prime I create this, and at some point t later I annihilate it, it doesn't matter if I create this particle only after three days, and then after the same time difference annihilate one. It doesn't matter because this state doesn't change in time. If this would change in time, then things would be different. That's why I wrote here from the start t minus t prime. And we will also sometimes look at the Fourier transform with respect to um, t minus t prime. So I understand the object and it depends on R 
of um, and omega. So this this looks horrendously complicated, um, but one can actually uh, with very few steps of algebra use a nice representation of this Green's function. So it goes in high here, imaginary unit. Um, and I will just uh, write down for you this representation. That's what the numerators are. The denominators 
you see immediately are energy differences. But energy differences of the n and n plus one particle or n and minus one particle system. So that's long neutral excitation energies. Yes? Could you explain the distinction between side the operator and side the wave function? So that's uh, uh, second quantization. Um, when I write this hat here, it's an operator that creates creates a particle or annihilates at point R. Creation of innovation Okay. So what does that mean? This is something quite exciting. It means that the poles of this object as a function of frequency are actually very close to um, photo electron spectra. Measurements that one does in photo emission and inverse photo emission. So if you have, let's say, a solid and you irradiate that with a laser with frequency omega and then the solid emits uh, an electron with a certain energy, then you can look at the energy balance. So you come in with a laser, H bar omega, that's given right, in the experiment. You can choose the frequency of the laser. And then due to energy conservation, this creates an electron that flies away, so the solid now originally was in the ground state energy um, of the end particle system. Now with this electron being gone, it's an excited state energy of an N minus one particle solid. Right? And this electron takes um, a kinetic energy away. So this thing is what you measure. Right? This is given, and the energy difference between those two, that's the excitation, non-motional excitation at the solid uh, uh, encounters in this experiment. So this kind of experiment is called photoemission. And there's also inverse photo emission. So here's again the solid. In that case, we come in with an electron, and out comes light, h bar omega. And in this case, the energy balance is h bar omega equals the ground e, sorry the n of n plus one minus the ground state n plus kinetic energy of the electron. Now in this case, this is the incoming particle. So this is given, I can choose the energy of the incoming electron. This frequency of the outcoming light is measured, and in this way I can know what the energy difference in the solid is, so it's the excitation energy of the solid, but again, a non-neutral one, maybe one where I've added a particle minus the ground state energy of the original n particle system. So this horrible object that I wrote down here, uh, once you deduce this form of it, you see that's something that's very close to experiment. You just need to look at this object as a function of frequency, and we see the photoelectron spectrum. <coughs> this is non neutral excitation energies of a solid. Yes? And what happened again? That's the eigenstate. So in the very first line, 
my talk, I have to show you the equation. H psi n equals e n psi. So that just enumerates the eigenvalues of the full problem. And so it enumerates the excited states of the system. For a solid, that will typically be some crystal momentum and some back in and so on. Yes. Well, this depends on the quality of the experiment. Also, the calculations that I will talk about more are also not perfect, yes. But yeah, I come back to that. Okay, so since it's popular to uh, to give homework, uh, your task is... Say, I have a hand in the other homework. <laughs> <laughs> so, first homework, there will be another one. And use this equation. This one. This nice one. It's not hard. I have it here with me in one page. Just start here. Plug in completeness and use a representation of the step function. And then you have it. It's, it's easy. So this is a calculation that every one of you should have done at some point in your life. So why not do it now? <laughs> okay, so that's the Green's function. Now, how do these objects hang together? In fact, the one-body density matrix, which in terms of the many-body weight function you can write down in this way, is also the equal time limit of the Green's function. So it's limit t prime minus t going to zero plus of the Green's function. And in this probably know already, the density is the diagonal of the density matrix. So these two arguments are the same. So these quantities are somewhat related. Clearly the Green's function is the most complicated object density matrix somewhat easier with the density even simpler quantity. So that's the quantity in terms of which the series are formulated. Then um, the energy functional which is then to be minimized later. In the case of the one body means function, this is the so-called phi functional. This is one possibility. It's also an energy, but details are kind of complicated. I will not touch that. Then, on the one body density matrix, there's just the total energy as a functional of the density matrix, so that it consists of the kinetic energy of gamma. Then there is like always the external potential term, so this is the density, so gamma of R comma R times the external of R and R. So this is N of R. Then there is a Hartree term, uh, like usual which is functional of the density, so also functional of gamma. And then there's an exchange correlation functional of the density matrix. And then, analogously, in the context of DFT, we have a total energy functional of the density, which we usually write as non-interacting kinetic energy plus the x 
Now the potential part plus the Hartree part. So some people write this as U, I, I write it as E Hartree, and the exchange correlation functional that we have been talking about a lot. So here the uh, index XE appears, um, but those are not the same objects, this guy and this guy. First of all, one is a function of the density, the other one is a function now of the density matrix. That's already a difference. But even if you imagine, plug in for a given system where you know the wave function, where you could calculate the density matrix and the density, if you would plug in those here and here, you would not get the same number. It's important to realize because in the context of density functional theory, we have singled out a non-interacting kinetic energy. In the case of density matrix functional theory, we don't do that because it's not necessary, because we can easily calculate explicitly the full interacting kinetic energy directly from the density matrix. So that's the slight difference. Okay, then we have a variational principle. And this leads to now we start again. Say just to keep the lines. Here in the density functional case, we have, as a result, one sham equations, so minus gradient squared over 2, plus the external, plus the Hartree, plus the FC. So all those are local potentials, multiplicative operators in configuration space. For density matrices, we get no single particle Schrodinger equation. This is a remarkable fact. Consider good or bad. Um, in DFT, you always have this statement that people say, oh, DFT is kind of a mean field theory, you have the single particle equation. Um, there's some truth to that, after all, for, although it's an exact theory. In principle, in practice, we have to make approximations, so there is some mean field character, after all, in the Kohn-Sham equations. There's no such thing. There is no such equation in the first place. So you just minimize. And what you do typically is you uh, imagine you diagonalize the density matrix itself. And the result of this diagonalization is called the natural orbitals. And those are occupation numbers. And what you do is you construct total energy usually as an explicit functional of the occupation numbers and the natural orbitals 
and directly minimize, both with respect to the occupation numbers and with respect to the orbits. Now, in the case of the von Wally greens function, the variation principle of that phi functional leads to a famous equation that is known as Dyson equation. And this looks like that. G equals G naught plus G naught sigma G. I will say more about this equation. Now, um, this equation is usually rewritten in form of a Schrodinger-like equation. This is also known as quasi-particle equation. And this looks like this, minus squared, squared over 2, plus the external, plus the heart tree, by J, R, plus integral, Sigma x c of r comma r prime comma omega equals epsilon j phi j of r prime if we are prime equal epsilon j phi j of r where the total sigma, this object is called set energy, is written as the Hachi plus sigma x. Well, this is just a convenient splitting. So, at first sight, this kind of looks similar to the cohn term equation, but there are important differences. It's an eigenvalue problem, yes, but the eigenvalue to be determined appears also here in the frequency dependence of the self-energy. So, the self-energy is a frequency-dependent object, and this seems to be evaluated at the eigenvalue which is yet to be determined. So this is a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. Also, this operator is an integral operator in real space, while the quantum potential is a, is a multiplicative operator. So in that respect, it's a bit like a clock. And um, yeah, so that makes the solution of, of this equation somewhat harder. Then, then the solution of the Kohn-Sherm equation, and this is now exactly the next category. So the numerical effort involved in solving these variational equations is here very hard. Then this minimization, somewhat intermediate, and the Kohn-Sherm equation numerically is somewhat easy. So not exactly easy if you have a complicated system, but at least in comparison, and in particular in comparison with the full uh, anybody can do. It's the single particle equation. But then you realize, you need to make approximations here 
that have to do with these potentials that appear. And this functional here. And this functional here. So here I will put difficulty in um, deriving approximate functional. And that is really easy in the many body case. So in this case we need to approximate self energy as a function of, of the Green's function. For example, an approximation uh, that is G times W. W is a screened Kuno interaction. It's easy. It's just a product. G times W. It couldn't be easier. Here again, it's intermediate. And here in the DFT case, it's hard. So it's exactly the opposite to think about. So in the case of, let's think back in the case of density functional theory, LDA was proposed in the Hohn by Kohn paper, so 1964. And the first really good, reliable GGAs was, I would say, 25 years later or so, maybe 20 years later. So long development, development of functionals is a process of decades, one could say. So that's hard. Here is the opposite, the GW approximation. That was written down 50 years ago. But to implement that and to overcome the numerical difficulties, in that case, took something like 30 years. So it's exactly the opposite. OK. Um, so one thing, um, this answers to some extent the question that I got uh, in, in one of my previous talks. Uh, what, what, uh, when should I use what? Should I use Green's function or should I use DFT? And uh, John is standing there ready, threatening me, so... <laughs> <laughs> How am I doing in time? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you've had 47 minutes already, so if you need a few more minutes... Uh, okay, so... Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I would say, as a, as a general rule, <coughs> so the one-body Green's function is best used for um, photo electron spectra, as I said before. ARPES, as it's called, the solid angular resolved photoelectron spectrum. As I explained, that's exactly what comes out of the Green's function directly. So that's that's exactly what we want. Um, density functional theory, which is by the construction of the whole theory, it's really best used for total energies. And in both cases, I would say, for weekly correlated systems, whatever this means exactly, we discussed that maybe a little bit. I would say, and this is a personal opinion, uh, if you want a true ab initio theory of strongly correlated systems, this does not exist yet, if one is honest, 
ab initio means predictive without input from experiment on that particular system. The best chance is to become such a theory is then the matrix functional theory. And the reason why I believe that is the following. Think of the prototype of a strongly correlated system that we had discussed in previous talks already a few times, the stretched H2. Now, there's one particular view of this problem, and this has to do with degeneracies. Right? If you stretch H2, there's two, thinking of CI expansion of the full wave function, there's two orbitals that are relevant, or that are most important. It's the bonding orbital and the anti-bonding orbital. As you stretch, the two become degenerate. In the infinite limit, they are degenerate. At the equilibrium distance, the bonding orbital has lower energy than the anti-bonding orbital. So but it's two important orbitals. Now think of Archie Fox theory or Cochran theory. It's been restricted. There's only one orbital that appears. One orbital one occupied orbital will spin up and spin down. And this one orbital has to do everything. But in the full wave function is the bonding and the antibonding orbital. Right? So it's hard to do. Right? So in principle everything is exact. Right? So you can do it, but it means that in the, in the DFD context this other orbital has to come in somehow through the functionality. Right? It's not impossible. It's, it's, it's possible, but it's harder. Now, in the case of density matrix functional theory, and this is what is really unique to this approach, is that you variationally optimize the occupation numbers. And then you see immediately what will happen. Even with the simplest function and also, you variationally optimize the occupation numbers. So one of these natural orbitals will be the bonding one, the other one will be the anti-bonding one, and the occupation numbers will be 50-50. Very variationally optimized. Comes out very naturally. So you're done, right? for, at least for this particular uh, um, strongly correlated system. So, so let me write this down here. The unique feature in my of occupation numbers so and this solves the H2 problem trivially now I think I mentioned this approach is among the three the one that is the least developed at this point in time, and um, for this reason, uh, I will, together with two colleagues, organize uh, a workshop here at SICAM in a couple of months on density matrices. Just want to make advertisement for that. <laughs> um, and yes, a final remark um, for all those theories. There exists the static version, that's what I've written down, and there exists the time dependent version. Right, so the time dependent version of TFT, uh, you have come to know already, TDDFT, for that, with that approach you can calculate neutral excitation energies. It's a different concept from this. Right. You don't change the particle number, you just lift up the particle to a higher, to a higher level. Um, but you can also calculate the full electron spectra of the CDBFT. This has been developed in the past few years. You irradiate the system with light and then you just look, you follow up the electrons that come out. So there's kind of wave packets and you need to project them properly to calculate the kinetic energy or so. But this can be done. And in fact, 
And that's the advantage of TDDFD in that context. You can do it beyond linear response. Any intensity of the incoming light is fine. Then the time-dependent version of means function theory. That is briefly indicated as before. If this state in which this is sandwiched by itself is already time-dependent, that's so typically a driven system, system driven by a laser pulse, then uh, the Green's function not only depends on frequency, but in addition on a time argument. And this allows you to describe time-resolved spectra in the virus sense. So time-dependent spectra is a very popular, very recent, and very exciting new mm. research topic that many experimentalists follow in particular. And uh, I would say at present that that's pretty much the only possibility to calculate such observables is through these uh, time-dependent and frequency-dependent means functions. It's called uh, Keldish greens functions. Those of you, uh, some of you might have heard of that. And there's also a time-dependent version of density matrix functional theory so far only uh, used in the linear response regime. So that's pretty much what I want to say. So we have five minutes for questions. Let's yes, quickly ask one question. Um, this question came up during the discussion of my poster. So the question was how do we get the band cap uh, from the uh, photo emission spectrum that we obtained from the GW calculation? Is it possible to uh, get the band gap from the spectrum? Because I usually get it from the band structure calculation. Um, it's not so easy, indeed. Yeah. So you ask, how, how is this done experimentally? Yeah. You need to do two measurements. One being uh, uh, photo emission, regular photo emission, and one being inverse photo emission. And you subtract. So one gives you uh, the, the electron affinity in, in chemical terms. The other one gives you the ionization potential. And the gap is given by the difference, I minus A. So that's how it's done experimentally. But you see already, this is not a good thing. Right? You have two different kinds of experiments. One, in fact, is surface sensitive. The other one is volume sensitive. So you get all kinds of undesirable effects on, on top of this. There's no good way, actually, of measuring the fundamental gap. There's good ways of measuring another gap, which is the optical gap. So that's, uh, since you're dealing with BSE, this is what you see in the optical spectrum, where you have essentially the fundamental gap, but within that gap, there's other lines, which are the excitons. Right? And the, the, from the upper edge of the, of the valence band to the lowest exciton, that's called the optical gap. That you can calculate both with linear response TDDFT and with, uh, uh, with Peters R. Peters, so that's the Green's function method to calculate response functions. Um, and you can experimentally determine it with uh, ellipsometry measurements, which is very unique and very uh, well developed. So no similar problems uh, involved like with, uh, with the fundamental gap. In fact, one can also determine the fundamental gap optically when you calculate the, the optical gap and then you see uh, uh, further lines which are the kind of hydrogen-like lines uh, of excited, excited states of the exciton. And they approach the lower edge of the conduction band. So that's another way so kind of extrapolating to calculate the fundamental gap. But whichever way you do it, it's not terribly reliable. Okay. That's <coughs> first. So I have two questions really. One is if the GW approximation is 50 years old or so, right? 50 years old or so by now. But going to a higher order approximation, is, would you agree that it's proven to be more difficult? 
Well, it depends what you do. So, by now, at least uh, a couple of groups have managed to evaluate uh, also the contributions of ladder diagrams. So, the W, as you know, is essentially RPA, so that's the bubble diagrams. Um, especially if you're interested in magnetism, the ladder diagrams are important. This is usually then formulated not in terms of the self-energy, but in terms of a related quantity, that's the T matrix. Um, so that's possible. But this was already numerically hard, so this is even harder. You're absolutely right. <laughs> but it's not out of the question, I would say. And the second question with respect to strong uh, correlation, you mentioned uh, that's the matrix functional theory or DMFT. Can you comment briefly about the other DMFT and then the field theory? Mm -hmm. Is there a possible solution for that? Yes. So, yeah, there I have an opinion that is um, strongly opposed by the strongly, com uh, strongly correlated community. <laughs> but, uh, in my view, this is not an ab initio theory in the sense that I uh, gave. And the reason is that even if you combine it with many body theory or with DFT, um, you, so these things that are called DFT plus DMFT and approaches of that kind, still, the DMFT step requires uh, a number U, the Hubbard U, and another function, delta, the hybridization function, and there are ways to calculate them from ab initio band structure calculations. And that's exactly what these people ideally ultimately want to do. But one has to remember that, let's say, the Hubbard U is not a sharp concept. You cannot write down a formula for you in terms of the many body wave function. It's just not possible. There's many ways of estimating this object. It has primarily an intuitive meaning, but there's no exact formula for it. So what do you do? And there's five different ways and you get five different answers. That's one problem. Another problem, <laughs> technical problem, is that you need to know, coming from the ab initio side, on, on which of the orbitals you want to put Hubbard U and on, on which not. And usually if you have some experience, that is more or less clear, but sometimes it's not so clear. And if you ever tried to put a U on, let's say, the P orbitals in a cuprate, you get complete nonsense. So you really need to know. I mean, these things that are semi-automatic, right, that calculate in a self-consistency cycle, the Harvard U, and then combine it with DMFT, it's problematic, right? You need to know where to put it, on which orbitals to put it, and then you have a choice of five different methods to calculate. Fundamental problem, and I believe in that sense it will never be an ab initio theory, is that there is no clear-cut way of calculating U. It just doesn't exist. So what, uh, you can ask a, what, I, what I hope will be a short answer question. Uh, two questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can only ask half of each one. So the first question is about the green function theory. It's quadriparticle. So the concept of quadriparticle has a lifetime associated with it. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the formula you have Oh yes, it does. I did not say that uh, uh, these energies are real value. In fact, they are not. So they have a real value in general. If your self energy is usually a complex uh, value object, so it's yeah. a non-hemisphere operator, so you have the real part and the imaginary part, and the imaginary part of the energy is associated with the lifetime. But if we look at the even implementation, it look all the item state information. I think from the point of view of the many body wave function. 
<laughs> and anybody swing it, sir? Is that what you think? Yeah. It's a different thing. Okay, look, maybe we should continue. <laughs> well, no, this is a research question. It's a student question here. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to quickly answer. No, I know <laughs> because it's, it really is, is a logical question in the context of the talk. Right? I started with the many body Schrodinger equation, there's these eigenvalues appearing, and then there's also these, uh, these uh, quasi particle energies appearing. Are they the same? And in fact, for a finite system, a molecule, and its discrete spectrum, they are the same. So these energy differences, non-nuclear energy differences. If you have a continuous spectrum, they are not. So these sharp states that you have in the many-body Schrödinger equation, they, they are dense in that case, and uh, they have an envelope, and it's this envelope that uh, uh, corresponds to to the quasi-particle eigenvalues. So it's, it's, it's something that has a width and hence a lifetime. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a boring party. Oh, a student question. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, those questions degenerate substantially. Sorry. Anyway, okay. Um, so the, you mentioned about the uh, finding of uh, electron binding energies with the uh, green swan event, which I I think from what I understood, it, it, those energies are in the eigenvalues of that other particle region. Yeah. No. Yeah. For a finite system. These uh, quasi-particle energies are, in fact, these total energy differences in the discrete part of the spectrum. Yes. Okay. And so, when we are solving the whole wave function, like the QMC, the couple cluster, this, where are the binding energies encoded? Binding energies? You mean total energy? No, the, 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 system, like, or the, well, the equivalent of like, like the homo eigenvalue in DFT is supposed to be the ionization potential. Mm -hmm. So where are the eigenvalues such as those, meaning we're yeah, it's, it's so. on yes. ionization energies yes. in the case where we are solving for the many body, not any of these three mm -hmm. methods, the, the many body wave function methods. Um, it's again these objects. You see if they are the same as those. Right? So if you uh, ionize, right, or add a particle, one is the ionization potential, the other one gives you the electron affinity. Yes, so you look at it from directly from the poles of the green structure. Well, are we still talking about the I if you so, ah, you asked for wave function methods. Yeah. So yeah. there you have the full wave function. You just calculate the total energy with that wave function. So the, the, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian gives you the total energy. And then you do it again for one You do it for n particles, particles, n plus one particles, and minus particles. So you minus one separately, three, cal three calculations. Okay. And from that you get it. Okay, uh, thank you. All right.